Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of The Brendan Burns Show. Joining us today is Ken Page, LCSW, renowned psychotherapist, and a leading voice of hope and wisdom for everyone seeking to find and cultivate healthy, lasting love. He is the host of the Deeper Dating Podcast and co-founder of DeeperDating.com, which is a new way for single people to meet online in a way that's warm, respectful, fun, and inspiring. Ken is the author of the bestseller, Deeper Dating, How to Drop the Games of Seduction and Discover the Power of Intimacy. And he has been featured in, oh, the Oprah Magazine, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Cosmopolitan, Advocate, and more. Ken is passionate about helping people understand the search for love as one of the greatest growth adventures in life. And he celebrates the inclusion of the LGBTQ community into the banquet of the wiser relationship advice. Ken, welcome to the show. I am so glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I was thrilled to get your invitation. Yeah, my pleasure. And so I want to start this off by asking a little bit about your story and how you became a leading expert on talking about love and intimacy and finding the one. Oh, yeah. You know, I love my story because it's a story of um, being so helpless and ineffective in my dating life. And um and moving past the thing that I felt the most screwed up on, you know, in my whole adult life by far. So, so yeah, I love that. I love that story. I love that I became, I kind of became a student of my failures because I was, I was, I called myself chronically single for decades. I was like tight bound in the kind of person that I was looking for in extreme ways. And that wasn't a particularly good type. Um, and I failed again and again, and I searched nonstop. I searched for decades with fierce passion and dramatic ineffectiveness. And um, I felt like, like this was my take on why that was. It was because there was something not attractive about me. And I had ideas about what that was physically and also emotionally and behaviorally. I, I, I knew what that was. It was the things I was most ashamed about, my vulnerability, my sensitivity, qualities that just weren't masculine enough. There was a whole range of things. Um, and I finally at some point said, I have to be a student here. I, I started a support group for chronically single shrinks like me that was like fabulous and life-changing and great. And I found therapists and I found friends and I just said, give me homework, help me here. And I rewired and it ended up not being that, I mean, it was a huge deal. It took me a really long time, but the points were pretty simple. But the piece, there were so many important pieces when I started tackling this as a spiritual journey as opposed to a dating game. But I think the most breathtaking piece to me was that the parts of myself that I felt the most embarrassed by and that I thought were the least attractive were the greatest qualities that I had. And they were what led me to my entire life now, a very rich, filled with love life. But they were the qualities I was most embarrassed by. And then I found out this was universal. And that's a very profound thing. And I'll just say one more thing about, well, a few more things about my story. So one thing about my story is that along the way, I was learning these lessons, I was teaching them, I was writing a book called Deeper Dating and I was as single as ever. And this was, <laughs> this was embarrassing, it was really embarrassing. So I had, to, I had to really kind of buck up and say, I'm believing in myself here because I think this stuff is real. But along the way, one day I went to the movies with a friend of mine and we saw All About My Mother by Almodovar. And um, at the end of the movie, I had this very strange feeling and I didn't know what it was. And I, I took a few minutes, I went to the back of the theater and I let this feeling kind of uh, come up. I didn't know if I would figure it out or not, but I did, it hit me with a bang. And it was that I wanted to be a father. I wanted to be a dad. And that began a journey to become a dad. And I adopted an infant um, and became a single dad. And uh, years later, met my husband 
and his two daughters at a gay family event. And uh, we now, almost 13 years later, are together and we're a pretty cool, um, blended, wonderful family. Uh, not that it's easy, of course it's not, you know. Um, I say this all the time, there's not a day that goes by that I am not humbled by my clay feet when it comes to love. I'm humbled all the time, all the time. But that's what love is for me. I had to learn. I had a lot to learn. How that's did you, kind of the story. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful story. And from listening to a lot of your podcast episodes and reading your book, Deeper Dating, I've noticed one of the big themes is you talk about taking what you might perceive as your own flaws and owning them as your gifts. Yeah. Could you, could you talk about that process and how powerful it might have been for you and how powerful it could be for the people you work with and, and what that would look like to actually show up on a date and what is it like to own? For example, with me, I've done a lot of work to overcome my anxieties and my anxiousness and lack of trust from my past. Mm. And now I show up and I'm, um, yeah. And like on some of the first dates, I just open up vulnerably about this and I kind of feel proud and I lead with it and you're going to attract someone who can hold that. And so I want to thank you for helping me see that. And I'm curious if you could talk about that concept of the core gifts and then how it kind of played out in your journey. Absolutely. I, I would love to. It's central to what I teach. But can I ask you a question first? Absolutely. So in doing that, in making that decision, like, have you noticed things shift for you as a result of that? And if so, what? If you don't mind my asking. Of course. Like internal shifts or in the dating both. process? Pro both. Okay, both. Yeah, I would say internally, I view myself um, with a lot more self-love. And I don't look at my dating process currently or my quest for love now as there's something that I need to change about myself. I think there was something in your book where you talk about people think self-improvement is a form of how to change who you are and, and fix yourself. Yeah. And yeah. that spoke to me a lot. So I can now say mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with me. And that's very yeah. liberating. Yes, yes. <laughs> You know, and then in, in dating, it's, it's unbelievable because I, you know, I'm starting that process now and, and I can share what I now consider my core gifts to these women and their faces, they're just so safe and not, not to say, oh, men all hide their stuff, but there a lot of people I think in the dating world are kind of accustomed to people hiding who they really are and hiding yeah. their bad sides. <laughs> That is fabulous. So you see that in women's faces that, that, yes, those are all the things that happen. And I have one more question. Do you find that weirdly you're meeting women who are closer to what you're looking for? Of course. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, I, Isn't that I, amazing. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's, it's really unbelievable how, and how quickly it's happened. Where, I'm so thrilled. I'm so yeah, thrilled. Like, like That's we so were, great. we were talking before we started the show about how I was in a hotel room with someone I was dating at the time and I was, she was sleeping. I'm listening to this podcast. Like, Oh my God, this is, I need to hear this guy Ken stuff mm -hmm. and how quickly um, I sort of, once I started to accept my core gifts, then the level of the consciousness and love of the women that I was then starting to go on dates with just went from here to here. Oh, isn't that amazing? Isn't yeah. that so amazing? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it really, it just proves how correlated the you doing the work is to who's going to show up for you. It's so true. It's, yeah. it's like, that is the closest thing to a miracle that I see in my work. And I see it again and again. So I love to hear those stories. And um, thank you, because I think that's a great way for me now to describe core gifts, because you just talked about like, you're someone who took that on and did that brave, brave act. And you're describing so beautifully the changes that happen when we do that. So that's, that's fantastic. So, okay. So imagine a target image, just a simple kind of target image. And imagine that, that the further in you go to the center of that target, the closer you're getting to the truest part of your being. 
the place which is like the beating heart of your humanity. It's where you could be hurt most, and it's also where you could be inspired most. So that's the bullseye. That's where you are really, you know, it's like the inner petals of your being. And then picture, the further you move out, it's like the more of an airbrushed version of you, the more of a safe version, the more of a defended version, a more of a version that is uh, looks cool. So the closer you get into the center, the more alive you become, the more love that you manifest, uh, the more passionate you are, and the more you kind of identify your unique genius, like the language of the being that you are. And the more you become magnetic to the people who are looking for somebody like you. But also, as every one of us knows, the heat goes up the closer you get in toward the center. Shame comes up, unworthiness comes up, past trauma comes up. It is not easy to live from your core. It's the journey of life is learning to bear the heat of our core in homeopathic growing doses because it's so powerful and so intense and so real. So that's the inside, that's the core. That's where our core gifts lie. The further out we go, the safer we are, the cooler we feel like we are, but the more disconnected we are. So the next zone is the zone of protection. That's where we're kind of defended. Um, our defenses are up, we're kind of numb. We're not really risking in really huge ways. We're showing a safe version of us. And then when you go out further, that's the zone of disconnection. That's like where it's really cold out there, but you're really separate and you're really safe. And that gets dangerous, that zone, because it's so disconnected. It's like you're so far from the heat of the sun. So the journey is to be able to bear living closer and closer to that center and to dignify and treasure what's there. That is where your core gifts lie. And the core gifts are at the heart and soul of everything I teach. And those are the parts of you where you're the most you, where you're the most alive, the most tender, the most fierce, the most you, the most you. And we have to learn to bear that and grow up into that and handle the power of that and do it with kindness and work with the trauma that comes up. But that's the journey. And this is the formula. I'll tell you what the formula is, and then I'll tell you an easy process to begin to know what your core gifts are. The formula, which is just breathtaking to me, is this. The degree to which you know what those gifts are and you cherish them, you actually treasure them, is the degree to which you're going to be sexually and romantically attracted to people who are good for you. And you'll magnetize them. The degree to which you shun those parts of yourself or hide them or reject them is the degree to which you're going to end up again and again with people who are not right for you. So that's I just want to make thing. sure I get that right because that's huge. It's huge. The yeah. more you really treasure and love and embrace those deepest core gifts. Yes. And I want to hear your process on how you figure out what those are. Yes. The more emotionally and sexually attracted you are to people who are good for you. Yes, it's really <laughs> true. It's That's incredible. really true. Yeah. It is incredible. And then the mystical kind of woo-woo piece is, with a little bit of science behind it, um, is that the more you do that, the more you notice those people. And there's a research-based principle called the principle of instrumentality, which is you know a highly researched attraction principle which is the more somebody meets your goals, the more you'll notice them and be attracted to them. If your goal becomes looking for someone with whom these parts of you feel safe and seen and like they could blossom, the more you'll notice them. So yeah. there's a little bit of science behind this, you know, mist, but I think it's mystical too. I think it's, a, a, it's the deeper physics of dating. Um, yeah, so that's the principle. And the reverse is equally true. The less you do, the more you're going to end up in the wrong relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Which is such a common reason why people are perennially single or frustrated and in these relationships is, and I see a lot of people 
blaming their partners, but I think it's really powerful. You've helped me take responsibility for how I'm creating this by shunning my core gifts and then going and just finding someone who feels the same way about me. Yes. And it's so exciting that you're experiencing all these shifts already. I mean, that's like very hugely promising. That's fabulous. So there's hope for me. I'm Big hope. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I know the feeling because that yeah. was my feeling was like there yeah. is, there wasn't hope for me because I just, this is how I got it. Like in my head was like, there's an it about attractiveness and I don't have that it. I just don't have it. And that's why I keep failing. That was my deep, deep belief until I learned that this was really what was going on. Yeah. So could you talk about maybe some examples of core gifts for the listeners? And then it sounds like you have a process for how someone can identify what their core Absolutely. gifts are. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Um, and then later on, I'll tell you how people can, you know, for free, get, uh, get that process. Yeah, that would be you know, great. I, I've heard that sometimes you give away parts of your book and we obviously have your deeperdating.com that we want to share with everyone too. Right. Yes. So I'll get to how you can get the chapters that teach you how to do this, but I can give a nutshell that I think is going to be, is going to be really helpful. Perfect. Okay. So your core gifts are the places where uh, life fills your heart the most and hurts your heart the most. That's how you know. You have the most kind of emotional nerve endings there, both for pain and for joy. And they're kind of universal. Core gifts are kind of universal, but they're also like, they're like fingerprints. They're universal, but they're all really unique. So for one person, like intense truth in a relationship is like their oxygen. They need it so bad. For another person, it's close connection. It's just different for each one of us. We all have flavors of those things. Everybody wants truth and integrity. But for some people, yeah, because our core gifts demand a lot of refined fuel and every core gift needs its own fuel. And that's part of the journey is knowing what that fuel is. So core gifts can largely be divided into two categories. See, everybody, you could think about which which of these categories you have core gifts in you probably have have both and if you're listening to brendan's podcast there's no question but that these gifts are alive in you or you wouldn't be here so so one set of gifts is sensitivity that's like tenderness an ability to uh to um notice shifts in mood and in energy in connection, and you feel that stuff really strongly. And I wanna say something, because you talked about anxiety, um, which I share, Brendan. Um, people with an anxious attachment style or an insecure attachment style often have a tremendous core gift. And that is a deep sensitivity to nuance of connection. So like somebody often with an anxious attachment style can be in a group of people and everyone is fine and they're just cringing because something happened that hurt or something's going on that's off and they're just so uncomfortable in their own skin and they think, man, am I anxious? But what they really are is registering. So that's like the secret gift of people with those attachment issues. And the secret non-gift to people who have really secure attachment styles is they often numb those parts because they wanna maintain the security and solidity of their capacity to attach, which is why they could be such a perfect combination together. Right. Um, anyway, so one category is the category of sensitivity, intense sensitivity. The other category is one of passion and intensity. So if you've been told you are too much, you're too intense, you ask for too much, you need too much, you demand too much. If you've been plagued with people telling that, telling you that, I can guarantee that you have gifts of a size of capacity for passion that is bigger than other people have. If you've been told you're too sensitive, and a lot of you have been told both of those, I've been certainly told both of those um, in my life, 
if you've been told you're too sensitive, oh, you're too vulnerable, you're like too fragile, you feel stuff too much, um, you're high maintenance in either of those two ways. If you've been told that you have core gifts of deep sensitivity, if you, uh, and here's another one, it's like a gift of, of needing con connection. So if you're someone who really registers when connection is off or not happening and it makes you anxious and it causes you pain and it makes you chew your nails or be really uptight or like, you know, want to get a dopamine hit from somewhere, it just, there's an emptiness inside. It bothers you. You expect more connection, deeper connection. That's a core gift of connection, really caring about connection. So I guess it's really, I've always said there are two, sensitivity and intensity, but I think that there are three and it's like a, a, a depth of feeling around the issue of connection. So those are three categories. Um, obviously I developed this as I learn and um, three categories that core gifts fall into. And here's how you could discover your own. There's a lot of different ways. One way is what I just said. Have people told you you are either too much, too intense, or not enough, like too vulnerable, too sensitive, not tough enough? Guaranteed your core gifts lie there because our core gifts, our deepest places of insecurity are X marks the spot where your core gifts lie. It's just really true. So the way to discover that, in addition to knowing how people have like put you down, the qualities you've been put down for, your core gifts lie there. The other way is to ask yourself, and you do this, this is like a two day exercise. Two days, have a journal or have your phone and note down every time your heart feels hurt by an interaction with the world or another person. Just note it down and then think, what could this say about what a gift of mine might be? because I obviously am caring a lot about this, like more than I even think I should. And it's the points we care the most that are our core gifts. And you do the same with the things that hurt you and yeah. also the things that fill your heart. So, so let's say something happens where it really impacts you, a situation, uh, an interaction, something like that. How do you, like, what specifically do you look at in that situation to help you extract what your core gift is? Good, good, good. Yeah, thank yeah. you. So, so let's say something hurt you. You ask yourself, what hurt me? What is it that hurt me? And at first, you'll just tell yourself you're too sensitive. That's the warning sign to kind of keep going into this adventure. But you think like, what hurt me? What if it actually made sense? What if this was not just my neurosis? What if I'm picking something up here? What might that be? And then what does that touch about what matters most to me? Like just a story about that. I was with a group of people and uh, we were with someone who was an artist who was brilliant, but very self-involved. And um, I really respond intensely to art. So I was freaking out over her work. I was so excited and I wanted to talk about what it meant. She was incapable of doing that. It was so upsetting to me because I was just so thrilled and I wanted to connect with her. The other folks in the group were like, you know, they just moved on. I was like hungry for talking about this amazing art, but I couldn't. So it was pretty depressing and upsetting to me. In the past, I would have just thought, oh, Ken, you are such a trip. You are so neurotic. But I was able to think, no, I cared so much about this art. I was hungry to talk about it. That's a core gift. Yeah. So that's an example. Like, what are the values that this is upsetting for you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I think about some recent situations, it helps me see that some of my core gifts are definitely around sensitivity. And, mm. and the ability to emotionally connect and perceive, and obviously that can trigger pain in me. But instead of saying, you're too sensitive, you're too emotionally dysregulated, it's about saying, wow, look at how connected you are to what's happening here. And, totally. and, and kind of totally changing the frame there. around what Right, like, like in a yeah. way, like, look how big your heart is in this yeah. situation. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Definitely continue if you have other ways to kind of connect with your core gifts. I do also want to ask you about attractions of inspiration Ooh, ver versus yeah. attractions of deprivation because yeah, and then talk about that. Yeah. And then along those lines, like 
you know, when you talk about, oh, if you're attracted to someone 10 out of 10 and they make you weak in the knees, what that means. Totally, totally, totally. So I will say one more thing about this, that the other part of this exercise is noticing the things that really fill your heart, that give you a sense of deep meaning. That is a big deal because those are your core gifts too. That is the language of what sets your heart on fire. That's the language of what makes your heart swell, what makes your love swell, what makes your sexual desire swell, all those things. We need to know the things that really, that's your fuel, that's your gift fuel. Whatever it is that just happened, that filled your heart, that's the fuel that your core gifts need. So naming what that is, maybe it's kindness, maybe it's truth, maybe it's thinking outside the box. That's the other way that we can identify our core gifts. And when we do that, like you do that for two days, it's like a connect the dots puzzle. You connect these disparate dots and a picture forms. And that picture is gonna be your beautiful core gifts, your essential core gifts. Mm. That reminds me of when I used to work in finance in New York City. And on the weekends, oh. I would go out to Westchester or New Jersey for these personal development events. And I'd come back and all my the Wall Street bros that I was having lunches and drinks with would say, oh my, it was a lot of judgment and a lot of, <laughs> what, what are you doing, Brendan? And uh, yeah, and then just sort of learning how to accept my passion for personal growth and this new career I wanted to create um, as a core gift. And then kind of ultimately attracting in other people who really supported that desire of mine, even if yeah. it was just friends at the time. Yeah, yeah. Then that's like this whole evolutionary journey. And if we have time, we'll talk about that too. Um, but yeah, you just listed a lot of things that are like big and important to talk about. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, why don't we talk, if you have anything else on the core gift to go ahead, but why don't we talk about the attractions of inspiration and attractions of deprivation and what that is? Yes, yes, yes. And that's actually the part of my book that Oprah excerpted was exactly that. What attractions lead to love and what attractions lead to pain. Mm -hmm. So that's a big one. So I'll tell you my story with that. Yeah. So I, you know, I was really bad at having this certain type. And it was like a kind of cocky, arrogant guy, like a bad boy type. And what it was, I came to realize later, was someone who didn't feel things at anywhere near the deep level I did. A guy who was like just impervious to all of that empathy pain and all of that sensitivity. So that was really attractive to me because I couldn't bear it in myself. Um, so I was attracted to these people who couldn't commit and weren't really that interested in me again and again and again. Um, and I was really stuck there. And I remember I had this revelation one day as I was kind of beginning to learn and do this work. And I remember this guy named Bruce in high school who was an incredibly kind spiritual guy. And he changed my entire world. He literally changed my life with his goodness, his kindness, his spirituality, he blew me away. He changed my entire world and I fell in love with him and he was straight. So it didn't work out um, at all in that way. But I, I remember thinking, oh my God, I was completely attracted to this guy and he was good and decent and wonderful, like truly wonderful. Maybe I have this other like non cocky bad boy circuitry that I didn't know about. And that was the beginning of discovering that those were qualities in me that I had tried to suppress my whole life because they look too weak and too stupid and too vulnerable and too unmasculine. And so what I found was that the more that I could honor those parts of myself, myself the more I was meeting guys who were who also liked those parts of me and I wasn't running for the hills. That was a gradual process, it took years. But I realized I have two circuitries and that most of us do. So one is attractions of deprivation. So those are hot and sexy, they could feel white hot. And like, because it's like, you know, that's a very sexy thing when you can almost have something but you can't have it. I mean, that's so much what happens even in a committed relationship. It's like the sexiness of the parts that are still like, oh, I get to do that. I get to touch that. Like, 
there's there's an excitement about that which is um, secret or hidden or not so available. So we get so attracted to people who are not available or they're almost available or like they almost love us right or they almost could touch us in our deepest parts but they don't again and again or we have these transcendent experiences with them and then they're gone or whatever i mean if you're human that just grabs you and it feels like love but it's really kind of the path to hell those are attractions of deprivation and it's an entire circuitry and we could get lost there for years so uh, and I'll say one other thing about that. Like the thing that makes it so sexy is it hits the place of I'm not good enough. I'm not loved enough. And if I could just do fill in the blank, I'll finally win that love. That's really an intense pull because that goes way back. Yeah. Um, and couples theory shows us that the people who are like crazy exciting, like nines and tens, like you were saying, people that make you weak in the knees, often are that way because consciously used to their good qualities, but unconsciously you register, this person is risky. This person might not be able to love me. This person could betray me. I don't feel totally safe with this person, but, but I could win them over. So unconsciously, that's what's going on. You're finally, you're going back to the scene of the earlier crimes to finally get loved right. Those are attractions of deprivation. And um, I thought that was like what I was looking for for decades. Yeah, I mean, that, that resonates a lot with me and kind of my journey of being in relationships and being so frustrated and really blaming myself while I'm in those relationships of yeah. I need to be more independent. I need to let go more. I need to become stronger, more emotionally. Yes. Yes. When there were all these women who I said no thank you to that were my attractions of inspiration. And That's so it. then That's I it. got caught in this cycle of thinking like I'm not ready for a relationship yet because I still have all this work to do. But what I found in, in hearing your story and some other people's stories is that when they let in the attraction of inspiration, they're much more ready than they thought they were. Because they're not ready with an attraction of deprivation because you can never be ready, right? You can never really be fulfilled. That's true. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah. 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 You will always stay not ready when yeah. you're doing that. That's what That's I think. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's great. So, I love what yeah. you said. There was so much in what you said. Like you captured so many pieces of this so, so well. Thank you. Uh, one thing that's helped me a lot hearing your show is you've talked about kind of what an attraction of inspiration is and then yeah. kind of specifically how to really identify that consciously totally. in someone else. Yeah. 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 Cause then that's the next stage. And I want to say like attractions of inspiration are hard in a different kind of way, like in a really way different kind of way. And so there are skills to be developed and you won't be ready and you're going to have to cultivate, you're going to have to rewire. If you're used to attractions of deprivation, there's rewiring that needs to happen, but it's good rewiring and it's eminently doable. It is doable rewiring and we got to start somewhere. <laughs> we got to start somewhere. So, okay. So I'll say one other thing. Thing. Well, no, let me explain attractions of deprivation first, of, of inspiration first, sorry. So an attraction of inspiration is where you are inspired by a person's goodness, capacity, decency, honesty. You are inspired by the being that they are struggling to curate in the world. That's the kind of person who would inspire you maybe by their success, maybe by just deep qualities. My dear friend, Hara Moreno, who's the editor um, at large of psychology today, she says there are three C's that you need to look for. And the first is character, the second is character, and the third is character. <laughs> and I nice. think that's so, I know, I know, it's so true. <laughs> yeah. So that's what you wanna be inspired by is a person's character, goodness, truth-telling, appropriate availability as you get to know them more. 
And when you find somebody that you're physically attracted to, and you have this deep down sense of their goodness, even in hard times, not their perfection, but their commitment to try to be a good person. And you really feel that sense of, of these character traits and you're attracted to them and you both are connecting. There is no greater joy. It's a joy that's like peaceful and explosive at the same time. It's the best feeling in the world. It's a feeling that, you know, it has legs, it has sustainability. And that's what we're looking for. And those are the relationships, like what I would want for everyone who's listening to do is to get to a point where you could make a commitment. No more attractions of deprivation. I'm shutting that crowded door. I'm pushing it closed. I'm shoving it closed. I will only go for attractions of inspiration. That's the path to happiness. Yeah. How do you, so let's say you've, heard this content, you've done some rewiring, you've, you've started to integrate it. And now you're out there and you're dating. Yes. And you're meeting a totally new batch of people who are much more inspiring than depriving. But how do you really know? And how do you say, you know, cause it sounds like it's a sliding scale. It's not totally, binary. Totally. Right. Right. And, and so, right. so how do you then go on that journey? especially if you have more of some of these anxieties from the past and there's like a fear of letting go of someone, you know, at what point, cause no one's perfect. No one's perfectly inspiring and secure totally, and loving, totally. right. you know, ha and maybe how did that show up for you if it did? And what would you say to someone out there who is like, Ken, I, I don't do the deprivation anymore, I think. And I have some much more inspiring people, but do I keep rewiring for another six months and keep doing my own stuff and say, oh, these women are close and only if it's like a, oh my goodness, yes, go in. Or do you kind of give it a chance, keep going on dates with women who seem more inspiring? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you just raised like a zillion fabulous <laughs> points. So yeah. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to try to, and, and I'm exactly. going to try to track them the, to the best of my ability. Cause there was yeah. so much in what you said. Yeah. Um, so, so one thing I want to say though, is that there is kind of an interim, there are two weird interim steps in this journey. And I don't know if you've experienced them, but so one of those steps is that it's not like you necessarily only just start meeting a better quality of people that does happen. But the other thing is you say no more quickly. Like there's this discrimination stage where you're like, uh-uh, no, like much, much more quickly. Yeah. And that's a really important piece of this. And then the other piece is there's this very quirky thing that happens also, which is like when you make that decision, often there's a period where nothing happens. It's like, what? There's none of these bad relationships, but nothing new is coming in. What is up? And that's often a stage two. So I just want to make room for those complex stages because, you know, it's, it is complex. It's a rich process. Yeah. So then in relation to what you said, though, um, it is absolutely a scale. And this is a question that I love. This is a question I love. And I think that we should make this our number one question when we get out there to date. Our number one question. There could be, a, there, there has to be a number two and a number three and a number four. But the number one question is, does my heart feel safe with this person? And you're not going to know for sure. You're not going to know for sure, but you'll have a growing sense and if your answer is, yeah, my heart feels safe like 80% of the time, but then 20% of the time, I feel like fractured and weird and upset by the things that they do, that's not a good sign. If you say, yeah, I do feel safe with them. My own stuff comes up and I get afraid and all of that, but like, I'm kind of feeling pretty safe with them regularly. That's huge. So what we do is we check in inside and we say, does my inner self feel an essential safety? That's how you're going to register good character. Good character registers as a feeling of safety inside and you want it and you need it. So I, I love that. I love that question. Mm. 
Yeah. So powerful. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's we like, all need, we all need that and we all deserve that in a, in an intimate relationship. A hundred percent. A friend of mine says like looking for a relationship is like going to a shoe store. You don't want to walk out with this shoe that like looks great and it hurts you. And you say, I'll probably grow into it. I'm sure it'll like loosen up. Like <laughs> you wanted to uh, feel comfortable from the beginning. That is such a good analogy. Isn't that great? Yeah. 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 You see this shoes, you know, you're going to hate them, but they look so good. <laughs> And so you just buy them and then you have physical pain and you're frustrated yes. all yeah. the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So then obviously you have to be physically attracted. Obviously there need to be other things too. But when you make that your first question, it's like a necklace with a million parts, but it's like a cascade and one part is the top and you, it's all a mess. And then you hold it up and the first part leads to the next parts, which lead to the next parts that kind of cascade happens when you start with does my heart really feel safe with this person yeah and i'll just say one more thing about that you know in my intensives there was someone who said to me when i brought this up she said i don't get that at all i think that's like bullshit because how the hell am i going to know if my heart feels i can't tell and she said i've been in a lot of relationships where i've been betrayed again and again so i can't tell and by the end of the intensive, she said, no, I actually cultivated the capacity to know. And she was with someone who was safe and kind. So it's not easy and it takes time and it really takes time. You know, you don't know. You find things out as time goes on, but you learn as you go. So yeah, big, big, big question. And then um, the other piece is that the wavelengths of attraction with an attraction of inspiration or like a little slower because there's not that roller coastery kind of thing. Like you may be like having to get used to feelings of just feeling like nothing's going on, but I feel peaceful and good inside. Well, what is that? That doesn't feel like the romance I knew before. There could be like a stillness or a quietness to it, a lack of intensity. And then for me, Every time for decades that I was in an attraction of inspiration, I fled within the first four dates because I didn't know what it was, but all of a sudden I started getting disinterested in them. That was something called the wave that I didn't know about. Um, but that's another thing that can happen. If you're used to these crazy relationships, when you find an attraction of inspiration, almost guaranteed you're gonna feel claustrophobic, bored, disinterested or judgmental at a certain point along the way. You just will. And it's part of your psyche rewiring. It's like a spasm of fear manifesting as disinterest. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about because yeah. this happened to me a few years ago and I had not accepted my core gifts yet. I had not understood all these dynamics at the time. And she and I, um, it was the most drama free dating I had ever done in my life. Wow. It yes. was like, we never fought. We were on the same page about everything. Wow. It was totally available. Like my old pattern would be again, to just go after the attractions of deprivation and then constantly be frustrated that they're shutting me out, not giving me enough closeness, not inviting me to stuff with family and friends and just constant, that constant push pull me wanting more of them pulling away. Yeah. And this and was the first, one of the first times, maybe the first time, only time so far in my life where it was all available to me. And I just wasn't able to let that in yet. And I accept that. And I'm striving to create that with someone new and get to that place where I can do that today and in my, you know, in the near future. But I remember, and this kind of leads into my next question, I remember sort of justifying it in my head by saying, oh, I'm not attracted to them. Yes. And so I'd be curious, I know you've already talked about this today, but a little bit more about kind of what, you know, letting that healthy attraction build. Cause I've heard you say on shows, give it like what, three, five dates at least, you know, even if you think you're not attracted. And then obviously talking about riding the wave and letting the attraction build. So if you could talk a little bit more about that. Oh, it's great. You really explode my brain with all of these great <laughs> things. I just got to take a minute and think about like which I want to um, start with. with sure. that. Oh, yeah. 
Okay, so here's what I want to say. I want to kind of make a a kind of forecast, but not based on any psychic abilities at all, but just based on what I've seen. Given the stages that you've gone through in your journey, that's coming again. That's coming again because of everything that you've described. So that's an exciting thought. And you probably will experience the wave again. And um, so that's important to know. And we'll talk about what to do because there's a remedy for that when that happens. Yeah. Um, Okay, remind me again of one of the pieces other than that, of what you said. That Yeah, so so let's get to how to ride the wave in a minute. But before okay. then, just a little bit more on kind of how to know about physical attraction. Oh, when, yes. What, when am I using physical attraction as excuse to pull away from an attraction of inspiration? And when is it valid to just say, you know, I mean, I'm sure it's always valid, but like, when is it, okay, I'm actually not attracted to them. Right. Absolutely. So I have tons to say on this. It's a, it's a really interesting subject, important subject. So one thing I want to say, though, up front, you have no obligation absolutely ever, 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 ever to be with someone you're not attracted to yeah. because they're a good person. You are not obligated at all. It does not mean you're not spiritually advanced. And I promise you there are people out there who you'll be physically attracted to and who are attractions of inspiration. And that's what you need. So I want to say that first. And um, I want to say that, like, I think it's good to give three to five dates before you have full on sex uh, for a million different reasons. Mm -hmm. The biggest one being sex too early is like miracle grow for your fear of intimacy. You're either <laughs> going to get <laughs> you're either going to get clingy or you're going to want to run away. Chances yeah. are or you'll like just make the person into like, you know, uh, a booty call kind of person. Yeah. So. If there's no spark and there's never been a spark, you are off the hook, baby. You know, there's nothing to worry. It's just, it's just not on you. But if you start out being physically attracted to someone and then you start seeing their availability and decency and presence and your attraction plummets, that's a sign that it's the wave going on. Hmm. Yeah. So, and there are things that you can do to cultivate sex or also Maybe like you're used to dating people who are like nines and maybe the person you're dating is, let's say on your attraction spectrum, maybe they're a six and you're like, well, is this going to be enough to build a lifetime of sex around? Um, so the thing that I want to say about that is you can develop sexual intensity and desire. You have to know those skills to do that because no matter how hot a person is, you're ultimately going to lose your desire for them if they're a jerk and you have a horrible relationship. And there are ways to cultivate sexual attraction and desire that are science-based and really important and really good. Um, but okay, so, so what do you do when the wave hits you? Let's say there's somebody, let's just say there's somebody that you're physically attracted to, they're decent, they're kind. And all of a sudden, just like you described, like there's just not enough crazy drama or you, you just, they're just there. And all of a sudden you go, oh, damn. <laughs> like you, you kind of get afraid. And maybe you notice that because your sex desire for them diminishes or maybe you notice it because you get like really judgmental like all of a sudden her laugh is the most annoying thing in the world <laughs> like yeah. and it wasn't before um or you hate the way he dresses or you know those kind of things or you just get so judgmental this person isn't as smart as i need a person to be whatever it is you know whatever it is those are signs so what do you do then well there are, th this is the secret of the wave. It's a wave. It will not stay forever. And if you know how to ride it, it will go away. It'll hit you, it'll slam you, and then it'll pass. But only if you know what to do. So two things. The first thing is do not flee. Do not flee. Don't flee when the wave is hitting because it actually very possibly means that you just found your potential person. And your psyche is so afraid of the hurt that could happen that it's telling you you're not interested. It's just the wave is a spasm of fear, whatever it is you're afraid of. So don't flee, do not flee. Second, don't force yourself to do intimate things you're not ready for. 
Like, even if you've had full on sex and then you start getting the wave, don't feel like you have to do it again if you're not ready. Have partial sex. Ask yourself, what do I want to do physically with this person? Maybe, you know, you're not ready for the next romantic date. Instead, you decide, let me take a walk. Like, I love how this person is with their dog. So I'm going to hang out with them when they're with their dog because they're kind of sexy to me when I see how they are with their dog or whatever. Like, give yourself the space to cultivate those seedlings of turn on. Maybe you fantasize about doing something sexually with them. Maybe you're not ready to do that yet, but you could like have fantasies where you think about this thing that's maybe wild or crazy or kinky or just different or just just wonderful and hot you let yourself cultivate those things but you don't act on them and you don't force yourself and you don't pressure yourself you just like you take a little period to just enjoy what's good about them and guaranteed if you don't flee but you give yourself room and air almost guaranteed the wave's going to pass your attraction is going to come back and you will see if they're right for you in new ways afterwards. And if you're someone, it's the last thing I'll say about this, if you're someone who has habitually been drawn to people who are not that good for you, expect that that wave is gonna be heavy for you. I went through that wave with my husband. It was just mind boggling. Like I remember thinking, I have finally found a person who is so wonderful that I am not having the wave with. Like maybe it was just that I didn't find the right person. And then when I saw how available he was, the wave hit me with a bang. And I would say it went on for like eight months, like I'm in love, yay, thank God it's back, to I feel nothing. And I am so trapped that I don't even know what to do. It was that crazy for me for a long period of time. And then it did finally stop, um, but it took a long time. So just for those of us who really go through the wave like just be gentle with yourself and do those two things yeah the second one really stands out to me the the not pushing yourself with the intimacy because i find yeah. that with an attraction of inspiration um the most shame and the most pain can come up when embracing physical intimacy with that type of available person i've seen with people can be some of the most terrifying uh experiences to have so true exactly yeah. which is yeah. why we create the wave as an unconscious protection yeah so true so true yeah so my next question is um you know something that i've seen a lot and i know it's obviously tougher during covid um but i i just see i've seen so many people who have these amazing relationships that where they've really pushed themselves to get out there more whether it's going on dates through online or getting out to real life things oh. that they may not want to do. And I know yeah. your story about how I think two people pushed you and said, Ken, you have to go to this thing. And then you did and you met your your partner, your husband. So could you um, just kind of talk about maybe the value you see in getting out to like-minded events and programs and you know what it was like for you to maybe push through some of that? Um, oh, yeah. There? Yeah. Yeah, a thousand percent, because there I was teaching this stuff and I did not want to go to this event. And um, literally one friend, literally she backed me into her screen door with her face like so close to me. She said, <laughs> you are going. And I was like, OK, I'm going like for you to be talking to me like this. There is obviously no choice. I got to listen. So I did. And I met my husband there. Um, and it's really hard. It's really hard. But the key is the greatest key is to go to events and places and communities online and offline with people who share your deepest values. And I actually created an entire platform yeah. to help with that called deeperdating.com. Oh, here comes my cat. That's my cat. <laughs> still. I'm sorry. I'm just going to put her away. This is Mabel. Say hi to everybody. Hello, Mabel. <laughs> sorry yeah. About yeah that. No, no problem. So, yeah, tell us what deeperdating.com is oh yeah yeah so that's been a life work for me um i created deeper dating events when i first um adopted my child and i had an infant and it made me think how can i hope she doesn't jump on me from from the back um uh, and i thought how can i create an event for people who 
don't have a lot of time and are serious about finding love, like me. What would be an event that I would dream of going to? So I created an event. It started in the gay community. It got a very explosive response and spread to a lot of other communities uh, where people would get together. I would give a little talk and then I would break them into small groups and they would answer questions like, talk about something in your house that has a lot of meaning for you that someone gave you. Mm. Or um, talk about a relative that you always enjoy seeing at family get togethers. You know, fun, enjoyable questions that help people kind of really show who they are. And they would meet in a lot of different groups and then they would exchange numbers. I always wanted to create this online. So it turns out that my husband is an emerging technology expert. And so we built a whole platform to recreate those events and it's called deeperdating.com. And it's a way for single people to meet in a way that's respectful, kind, fun, and inspiring online. Because this is this other thing I wanna say about circuitry. Circuitry is everything. When you are in your zone where you're connected to your gifts and you go out there and date like that, you will notice different people. You will speak to different people. You will make different choices because you're engaging a much more wonderful circuitry than if you're swiping really quickly or you're afraid and uptight and you're trying to show your cool self. So this is an event that engages that better circuitry. So everybody can go there, deeperdating.com. You can meet people with events or without events. We are now building, we're getting incredible, exciting response from some of the world's biggest apps about this and some of the world's biggest researchers. So that's incredibly exciting to me. But it is what I believe is that, that online dating has looked for quantity, novelty, and immediacy as the yeah. ways to draw people in, but it's left out the secret ingredient, which is intimacy. So my commitment is finding ways to build intimacy on a platform itself, as opposed to just after people meet. Um, yeah. That's something I really believe in. No, I, I, I love that you're doing this. It, I think there's a huge need for it. Um, a platform that's very sort of mindful and spiritual and, and loving focused as opposed to, you know, swipe right, swipe left. Let me get a date tonight. Let me get a hookup. Um, so I, I really commend you for what you're doing here. Oh, thanks, uh, I, I definitely encourage everyone to go to deeperdating.com. Uh, I know I'm going to be checking it out. And, you know, one sort of question I have related to this is what advice would you give someone as they're making a, uh, a dating profile online? Because again, we're talking about core gifts and how can you be vulnerable? What would you recommend someone put on their dating profile that they might not normally put up there that you would yeah. say is a good idea? Yeah. Yeah. So I would say like, don't worry about being witty. Do not worry about being witty. People get really worried about being witty. Some people are naturally witty and that's glorious and that's great. But if you're not like this witty, witty person, don't worry about needing to be that. The photos, obviously you want photos where you look good, but also you want photos that like your friends would say, oh, that's that Brendan glow. That's you, that's the you I love. Those are the photos you want because they will really magnetize the right people. You gotta have those photos there. Talk about things that inspire you. Talk about people that inspire you. Don't get too into what you don't want. Don't go through a litany of what you don't want. You know what you don't want and that's good and that's fine, but don't go through like a huge litany of that. Talk about what you do want, what's important to you. Show your vulnerability. Don't be afraid to say what matters to you. And then when it comes time to giving your range of heights, weights, locations, and ages, expand further than you normally would yeah. because love is built to surprise us like what if your soulmate was a hundred miles further than the distance you put normally in your in your dating in your dating um profiles i hope and pray that you wouldn't say no to that person because they're a hundred miles away and like in new york city people are like nobody uptown Nobody yeah, 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 nobody. I, I, I was coaching a woman one time and she uh, she lived in Midtown West. And uh, she said to me, uh, you know, I'm looking for, I said, oh, what are you looking for in a relationship? Uh, either a lawyer or a doctor. 
um, who also lives in Manhattan, uh, this height. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, okay, what, what type of blood type do you want to? Yes, exactly. And she said, no Brooklyn. I said, no, exactly. no Brooklyn. Exactly. You wouldn't go 20 minutes on a train for the, for your dream guy. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So we got to stretch that. That's fear in camouflage again, too. But yeah. I want to say something about like the whole new age thing about like imagining and visualizing your perfect person and calling them in. That's yeah. really nice. But baby, you got to be flexible because, you know, mm -hmm. you know, if you're thinking that your spirituality has to be strong enough that you could call in, you know, somebody who like is also a pastry chef, like maybe you can. Yeah. But no, don't, you know, really, really stretch at the beginning and then see what the chemistry is like. So that's a huge and important thing. I just was speaking with this guy who um, said to me, I'm in a wonderful relationship with somebody and I wouldn't have been with her if I didn't hear that advice from you because she lives 25 miles outside of my city. And I always said no before that. So, yeah. so yeah, stretch in those ways. So those are some thoughts about online. Oh, and slow down your process slow down your process and take the step to speak to people because you might think someone is not exactly your type, but then you kind of check in with the weather inside and you're like, oh, I don't know why I feel peaceful and safe and great and funny and enthusiastic with this person. Maybe there's something more here than I realized. Like life surprises us with our romantic choices. You have this, the internal versus the external. And oh, I, I right. couldn't agree more. And what I really agree with you is that I think when people say mileage away or certain hair colors, these little things, like more shallow things, it's, it's really fear in disguise. And it's really, how can I continue my pattern of, yeah, because yeah. what I see so often, I don't know if you see this as your practice as a coach, but when I'm working with clients, they say, oh, it's their location or it's this or it's that, but it's really, oh, if they were being honest, they would say they're an attraction of inspiration that scares me. So I'm going to say it's how far away they are instead. Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. Because because life asks us to be brave. We have to be brave. You're not going to find your partner unless you're willing to be brave, unless you're willing to get out there, even though it makes you feel like sick and nauseous inside to have to go out there again and again. Like, we got to do that stuff. We got to do that stuff. Bravery is a real thing. Action is a real thing. Yeah. So since I found your show and your content, it sounds like you've had your marriage dialed in pretty well, but I'm curious since recording all these podcasts and going out and going on shows in the past safe couple of years, what have you most learned about relationships and intimacy? Do you mean from my teaching or from my own relationships? I mean about your own marriage specifically. Like, oh, you know, it sounds yeah. like most of the work that I've listened to, for example, you've done after getting married and oh, finding right. some level of intimacy. So what are some, maybe some of the more advanced or expert or personal um, lessons you've learned lately? Oh, sure, sure. Like I meant it when I said I'm humbled every day by my clay feet with loving. So um, I, I have been humbled by my needing to learn more about um, kindness, because I can have a short fuse and a temper and be irritated easily. I've had to learn a lot about controlling that. Um, and I have a lot more to learn. Um, I have learned that, and I've said this to Greg, I say this to him every once in a while, my greatest secret, my greatest secret that is the hardest thing for me to show you is how much I love you. That's mortifyingly scary to me. I got a lot of shame around that. Mm. That's a wild thing, but it's true. That's, you know, those are things that I need to work on. Um, I would say another one is that I can get controlling so it's this process of like taking the gift in that, which is like, I'm pretty fiercely determined and energized and passionate and I don't give up. That's the core gift. 
the wound around that, because our wounds surround our gifts, is a kind of like squeezing too tight, controlling too much. So it's this learning of being able to like hold my passion and love it and not disdain it because of its ferocity, but then like open my hands and allow room and allow space. Um, those are huge lessons that I learn every day. Um, here's another thing, one more. Um, Eli Finkel, who's a brilliant researcher, he talks about what the research shows about ongoing relationships. There's a gradient line about quality of communication in relationships, and it goes like this. It goes like, like, like this over time. Like 90 something percent of relationships, the quality of eros, connection and communication diminishes gradually over the years. So um, what I have learned is that, that it takes actions. Like Greg and I twice a day commit to doing this very deep tantric hug together where we just hold each other. And it's so powerful because I just feel it washing away all of the things I described just now, like washing them away. We need that to hold guideposts, to hold kind of what's good and to kind of keep growing as a couple. So those are just some thoughts that uh, come in response to what you asked. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ken, for sharing those. Uh, I'm talking to Ken Page of DeeperDating.com and the host of the Deeper Dating podcast and the author of Deeper Dating. Good branding <laughs> across the all three. Yeah. Um, any final words of wisdom you want to leave our audience with before we talk a little bit more about where people can find you and and how they can follow up if they want to learn more about your dating platform and uh, your book and these other resources. Yeah, I guess what I would say is this is a journey. This is what I say. The skills of dating are nothing more than the skills of intimacy. And the skills of intimacy are the greatest skills of all for the life you dream of. And so this is an adventure that is going to teach you deep self-love and deep bravery and the very same skills you're going to need when you're in a relationship. Those are the things that I would say, but what I would also say is that like your message and your story, Brendan, is so inspiring. This is like, you know, you're describing, as am I, the living experience of what happens when we tackle this and commit yeah. to deep authenticity as our path to finding love. It's an entire healing journey. And that's a beautiful thing. That's a hopeful thing. Yeah, no, no, thank you for saying that, Ken. It's uh it's really exciting to be kind of in the middle of the journey. And I, I try to talk about it a lot because when I first started my business, I left finance in 2016 and I started a coaching business and podcast, obviously. And everyone said, Brendan, talk more vulnerably about your wins and really talk about your losses. Mm -hmm. And I said, what? And they said, yeah, show, tell people how much money you made last month as a coach. Wow. And I said, and this is like, you know, a few within the first six months. And I think I had one client paying me 150 a session. And so I said, I made $300 last month. I can't put that out. And they said, no, do it. Because then when you can, when you're making full-time income, oh, I love that. people will see your journey. I love that. And the mistake that I made was I said, oh, well, when I get over there, then I'll start talking about it, which took okay. all the fun out of it. I love that. I love yeah. that. I love that. So I try to be really, really open about the fact that I'm kind of going through this process and calling in experts such as yourself, obviously, to help our listeners. And I have, you know, I'm so grateful. I have things on the wall. I have, I call it a love chest where every time someone writes in about the podcast, I put it in and it's, oh, you know, I it's, love that. it's pages and pages long and I read it to myself and um, so it's beautiful to be able to help others. And it's also kind of fun to be in the process and, uh, you know, not hiding that I'm going through it. And then obviously there are struggles along the way. Like I moved to California from New York in the fall. And so I talk about what it's, you know, should I, you date when you're moving? How do you, should you mm, update your yes. dating app to a state far away or all these things? And I try to be open because, um, you know, when other people are open, it, it helps me. Yes, yes. 
Yeah. yeah, yeah, you really show that and live that. And the positive things that you've described should be like, should be inspiration for folks like Brendan's living this and this good stuff really does happen. Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, I was able to sort of consciously decouple, learn from amazing past relationships. Totally. Like we were talking about before we started recording the who I'm attracting now or noticing more clearly now, it's, it's a different world. Oh, it's I, such a hopeful path that yeah. you're on. I love that. I'm excited. I can't wait to hear what happens next for you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. But yeah, thank you, Ken, for coming on the show. And let's just close out with one more. Please share a little bit more about your deeper dating platform and it, you know how people can go either to the events or, or online and how it works and any other sure. links you want to share. Perfect. Perfect. So I would say uh, Deeper Dating Podcast, and you can go there and sign up for my mailing list. You can get the first two chapters of the book, which will teach you the steps to discover your own core gifts. And you could also kind of become a part of that podcast world. There are 101 episodes now. Um, the other one is my book, Deeper Dating. And then there's also now a new audio course, which you can find um, on deeperdatingpodcast.com. I'm super excited about that audio and video. And then for people who are single and looking to experience these events or meet people online right now, just go to deeperdating.com. And uh, you can kind of begin a journey of connecting in a deeper, richer way there. And that's an evolving site and an evolving platform. And social media across the board with Deeper Dating. Well, Ken Page, thank you again so much for taking your time to come on the show today. Thank you so much, Brendan. It was a joy. And I hope to have you on my podcast as well. I'd love that. Great.